Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Sama sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed One The Worthy One The Supreme, the Enlightened One Sadhu, Sadhu Sadhu Namo Buddhaya Venerable Bhantes, meritorious lay disciples. Right now, we're living in a very fortunate time. The Supreme Buddha's Dhamma has been proclaimed to the world in a very excellent way, very clear way. Maybe since you've heard about the Dhamma all your lives, you think this is a very normal thing, a very ordinary thing. But actually, it only happens very rarely in this round of samsara. So in our pujas, we pay homage to the seven, to seven supreme buddhas. So how many eons has it taken us to find these seven supreme buddhas? 91 eons. And in this eon that we're living in now, how many of those supreme buddhas have existed in this, just in this one eon? Four of them, right. So, four in this one eon, three in, in uh, each in other eons. So how many eons does that leave without any Supreme Buddhas? Right, about 87 eons pass by with no Supreme Buddha arising in the world. So let's think about that. 87 eons without a Supreme Buddha. Right? And just a few eons that that have a Supreme Buddha arising in the world. This is a very rare thing in this long round of samsara. Not only that, think about all the people in this world right now who've never even heard the word Buddha, who've never even heard the word Dhamma, the word Sangha, who don't know anything about precepts, who only know about the things that they can see with their own eyes. They haven't had the chance to learn about uh, the results of actions, the different destinations that beings are, are reborn in. They have no chance to listen to this Dhamma. So, as we're sitting here right now, we know that we're, we have a very excellent opportunity, something that doesn't happen very often in this world. Now, another characteristic of this time period that we're living in now, it's the time after the Supreme Buddha has passed away, right? There were many, many very fortunate people uh, thousands of years ago, who had the chance to be alive when the Supreme Buddha was also alive and was teaching this, this Dhamma. But now we're living in the time after he's passed away. So fortunately, uh, his disciples continued to preach the Dhamma. And we have some of those uh, sermons, some of those conversations that took place in the time after the Supreme Buddha passed away. So. This is actually like the time period that we're living in now, isn't it? That uh, they were also alive when the Supreme Buddha had passed away. And we're living in this time when the Supreme Buddha has passed away. So we get to learn what was the attitude that these disciples had in this time period. What did they do? Did they give up? Did they say, well, that was nice, but it's over. Right Now we can go back to our old ways. Did they say that? No. No, they knew exactly what to do. So today we have this great opportunity to listen uh, to a conversation that disciples of the Supreme Buddha had after he passed away. So this is the Gopakamogalana Sutta. Uh, so uh, thus have I heard on one occasion the Venerable Ananda was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary, not long after the Blessed One had passed away into final Nibbana. And at that time, King Ajatasattu Vedehiputta of Magadha was suspicious of King Pajyota 
and he was having Rajagaha fortified. So he was nervous about this other king. And so he was having the city built up. He was having the city protected. So again, we can think, you know, this sounds very familiar. Don't we also live in a time when, when countries are fighting with each other? They're nervous one country is going to attack another. Right? So we can see this Dhamma, it relates to, to all, of our, all of our lives. That, that things were very similar in the time of the Supreme Buddha. Maybe they didn't have computers and, and iPhones and things like that, but the basic problems of life, exactly the same. People were greedy, people had hatred, people had delusion. And that's what's most important, because that's what we, what we learn how to overcome. So that morning, the Venerable Ananda uh, got up and he got dressed, getting ready to go in uh, to Rajagaha for alms. But he decided it was too early to go for alms. So he thought that he would go and visit this Gopaka Mugalana at his workplace. So he went there, uh, and this Brahmin was very happy to see the Venerable Ananda. So he said, welcome, please come. It's been a long time since we've had a chance to, to see you. Please come here, the seat is, is ready for you. Please have a seat. So uh, this Brahmin paid respects to the Venerable Ananda, and he sat to the side. And he asked the Venerable Ananda a question. He said, Master Ananda, is there any single bhikkhu who possesses in each and every way all those qualities that were possessed by Master Gotama, accomplished and fully enlightened? So this is the question. Is there any bhikkhu that possesses all the, the qualities of the Supreme Buddha? So let's begin by, by recollecting what these qualities are. So. Uh, what's the first quality of the Supreme Buddha? Arahan. So what does this quality mean? Yeah, he's, he's removed all of his defilements. He no longer has uh, greed uh, with his eyes for physical, for objects to see. He's not greedy for sounds to listen to, not greedy for smells, not greedy for tastes, not greedy for things to touch not even greedy for things to think about. So because he's uh, eliminated all of, these, all of these defilements, we call him arahang, arahang. So this quality of arahang, do we only find that in the Supreme Buddha or do we, do we find that in other, uh, some other disciples? Yeah, that we find in, in other disciples, don't we? This is the basic qualities of an arahant, someone who's eradicated their greed, hatred, and delusion. So the next quality, sama sambuddha. So what does this mean? Yeah, the Supreme Buddha uh, discovered these four noble truths without anyone, without anyone's help. He understood suffering. He eradicated the cause of suffering. Uh, he he understood these four noble truths all by himself. He didn't go to a teacher to get these like we do. Uh, he discovered them on his own the night of his enlightenment. So is this a quality of, of other disciples of the Supreme Buddha? No, this is a special quality only of the Sama Sambuddha that, that he was able to make this discovery on his own. So the next the next quality, vidya charana sampano. Yeah. So he was possessed of excellent qualities, uh, excellent knowledge, and excellent virtue. So he had uh, psychic powers. He had the ability to to understand the minds of of other beings. And his virtue was perfect. His conduct was perfect. You couldn't see any conduct in the Supreme Buddha, bodily conduct, verbal conduct, mental conduct, that had any, any flaws. He never uh, broke any of the, the moral precepts. So is this a quality uh, only of the Supreme Buddha, or do, are there other disciples who share this quality? Mm. Yeah. 
these qualities, we can find these qualities in other disciples as well. Many of his disciples gain psychic powers, the ability to know the minds of, others, of other beings. And all of the arahants, they have this perfect virtue, uh, this perfect concentration, this perfect insight. So this is a quality that's shared. Then the next quality, sugato. So he, he realized this path. So if the Supreme Buddha had only put an end to this round of samsara for himself, that would have been amazing, that a, that a human being could put an end to this round of samsara. That in itself is amazing. But he didn't do just that. He discovered a path. He discovered a method that he could teach to people so they could also put an end to this round of samsara. So he discovered a method that people could use. Now, is this a quality of, uh, of other disciples as well? No, this is a special quality of the, the Supreme Buddha, uh, that he was able to, to teach this Dhamma to others in a way that they could follow this path, that he discovered the method uh, for people to use to put an end to samsara. The next quality, loka vidu. So he understood these different worlds, the human world, the animal world, the ghost world, the hell world, and the heavenly world. He was able to, to see these different destinations. And not only that, but he was able to see how beings pass on because of their actions and are born in each of these destinations. So is this a quality only of the Samasambuddha? Or are there Arahant disciples who can see these other worlds, who can see how beings pass on according to their actions? Yeah, there are disciples that can, who have developed uh, the psychic powers to be able to see where beings pass on to other destinations uh, and to, to be able to visit these other worlds, to be able to learn uh, in detail about these other worlds, that this is a quality of other disciples as well. So, Anuttaro Purisadhamma Sarati, supreme teacher of people to be, tra- to be tamed, people to be trained. So the Supreme Buddha, uh, if someone had any chance of realizing this Dhamma, he was able to teach them in such a way that they could understand this Dhamma. Even if you or I might have given up on that person and said, oh, there's no chance that they, can, that they can realize the Dhamma. You know, it happened in the time of the Supreme Buddha. He might see someone and say, you know, this person, by the end of the day, he's going to attain Nibbana. He's going to pass into final Nibbana. Once he said that about a man who was riding an elephant. He was drunk on top of this elephant. And the Supreme Buddha said, is, and, and this man, he didn't even have, I mean, he was drunk. Uh, and so when he passed by the Supreme Buddha, he didn't even get down and pay homage to the Supreme Buddha. He just sort of nodded his head like, hey there, how you doing, Supreme Buddha, right? Shocking, amazing. But the Supreme Buddha knew this person, he has the opportunity to understand the, the Four Noble Truths on this very day, right? Would we ever guess that? Never. We would say, oh, going to a bad destination, right? That's what we would say. But he was the Supreme Buddha. He knew uh, the characteristics of individuals, the nature of beings. He could see the, the past karma that they had done that would allow them to realize these Four Noble Truths. So is this a quality of, of his disciples or only of the Supreme Buddha? Only of the Supreme Buddha. Even sometimes his greatest disciples weren't able to, to take someone uh, to, the, to the highest knowledge that they were capable of doing. Even the Venerable Sariputta, once he, he decided to teach a Brahmin only the way to the, to the Brahma worlds. And when he reported this to the Supreme Buddha, he said, why didn't you, the Supreme Buddha said, why didn't you teach him the Dhamma all the way to Nibbana? Right? So even as great, I mean, think about it, as excellent as the Venerable Sariputta is, the general of the Dhamma, the one who keeps the wheel turning, even he didn't have this, this perfect ability that the Supreme Buddha had to teach people uh, the way uh, to attain Nibbana. So the next quality, Sattā Deva Manusānaṁ, 
teacher of gods and humans. So not only did the Supreme Buddha teach human beings, but he taught heavenly beings as well. In fact, uh, sometimes people would be, uh, would be worshiping heavenly beings and not know, is, this, is the Supreme Buddha a disciple of this heavenly being, or is this heavenly being a disciple of the Supreme Buddha? Right? So then the Supreme Buddha would, would give the, the devata a hint and say, clear this up for these people, and then the devata would bow down and pay homage to the Supreme Buddha. So this quality of teacher of gods and humans, is this a, a quality only of the Supreme Buddha, or did his disciples also teach human beings? that his disciples also teach heavenly beings. Yeah. So there were disciples who taught both humans and heavenly beings. Not all of his disciples taught, but there were some who taught uh, both heavenly beings and human beings. And uh, the next quality, Buddha, so the Supreme Buddha taught this Dhamma without holding anything back. He didn't keep this Dhamma a secret. So he was able to, to teach other people this Dhamma. And then the last quality, Bhagava, so uh, Blessed One. So from this quality we learn the Supreme Buddha is the only one that has all of these qualities. That his disciples may have some of these qualities, uh, they may not have any of them, or they may not have all of them, but there are some disciples that do have, uh, that do have some of these qualities, but none of them have every single quality uh, in common with the Supreme Buddha. So let's, let's remember what's happening in this, uh, in this sutta, that uh, the Venerable Ananda has gone to visit this Brahmin, and the Brahmin has asked him, is there any single bhikkhu who possesses in each and every way all those qualities that were possessed by Master Gautama, accomplished and fully enlightened? And the Venerable Ananda says, there is no single bhikkhu Brahman who possesses in each and every way all those qualities that were possessed by the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. For the Blessed One was the arouser of the unarisen path, the producer of the unproduced path, the declarer of the undeclared path. He was the knower of the path, the finder of the path, the one skilled in the path. But his disciples now abide following that path and become possessed of it afterwards. So here the Venerable Ananda explains that the Supreme Buddha, he's the one that discovered this path. He discovered this method. We can remember the simile of the, uh, the city that was hidden in the forest. And the person comes along and discovers this city. They discover the way to this city and they make this way clear. So this is what the Supreme Buddha did. Uh, he was the one that discovered this path. Without him, his disciples would have never had the chance to realize this path to Nibbana. And his disciples, they follow the instructions of the Supreme Buddha and are able to attain this same, uh, this same result of putting an end to the round of samsara. So after the Venerable Ananda answered this question, they got interrupted. Someone, uh, someone came in, and it was the Brahman Vasakara, the chief minister of Magadha. He was working on these, uh, making the city strong to protect it. So he came in, and they had some polite conversation. He bowed down, paid respect to the Venerable Ananda, and asked, what was it that you were discussing? What were you talking about when I, when I walked in? And the Venerable Ananda explained, uh, this Brahmin asked me uh, if there was any single bhikkhu who possessed all the qualities in each and every way as this, the same as the Supreme Buddha. And I explained to him, no, that there isn't, that the Supreme Buddha is the one who discovered this path, who uh, made this path available for other beings to follow. So then the Brahmin asked, is there, Master Ananda, any single bhikkhu who was appointed by Master Gotama thus, he will be your refuge when I am gone, and whom you now have recourse to. So this Brahman was thinking about things in terms of uh, ordinary systems, ordinary groups, ordinary, ordinary organizations, because isn't, that, isn't it true that 
Uh, a king is very concerned about who's going to take over the kingdom when he dies. If someone owns a company, then they're very concerned. You know, when I, when I can't work here anymore, who's going to continue this company? Who can I appoint? Who, uh, who can be the leader of this company when I'm gone? This is a very ordinary way uh, that people think in this world. So it's a very, uh, it's a very normal question for someone to ask. Who, uh, is there anyone that the Supreme Buddha appointed to be head of the, uh, head of the Sangha when he passed away? So what do you think? Is there someone that the Supreme Buddha appointed as chief, head monk in charge? So this is what the Venerable Ananda said. He said, there is no single bhikkhu brahman who was appointed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, thus. He will be your refuge when I am gone and whom we now have recourse to. So in this time after the Supreme Buddha passed away, his disciples continued to continue to preach the Dhamma. And when a new person would, would hear the Dhamma from them, they would say, Oh, Venerable Sir, I go to you for refuge. I take refuge in you, Venerable Sir. And that monk would say, No, no, no. Don't take refuge in me. Take refuge in the Supreme Buddha. And the person would say, Well, where is the Supreme Buddha? I want to go and see him, to take refuge in him. And the monk would say, uh, the Supreme Buddha, the one who knows and sees, has passed away. But still, uh, go to him for refuge. Don't go, don't go to me for refuge, they would say. So then the Brahmin asks, he's, he thinks, okay, well, so the Supreme Buddha didn't appoint someone. So then he asks, but Master Ananda, is there any single bhikkhu who has been chosen by the Sangha and appointed by a number of elder bhikkhus thus? He will be our refuge after the Blessed One is gone, and whom you now have recourse to. So did the Sangha get together and have an election? Right, That's another method. People elect a leader. If the, the previous leader doesn't pick a new one, then people get together and they, they appoint a leader amongst themselves. It's a very normal thing in the world. So it's a good question that he asked. Uh, have you, has the Sangha chosen someone that when you have a problem, you can go to that? that person, and that person can settle your disputes. And then the Venerable Ananda says, There is no single bhikkhu brahman who has been chosen by the Sangha and appointed by a number of elder bhikkhus thus. He will be our refuge after the Blessed One is gone, and whom we now have recourse to. So he says, no, the Sangha didn't get together and pick a single bhikkhu. So now this brahman is, he's a little puzzled. He says, but if you have no refuge, Master Ananda, what is the cause for your concord? So what's concord? It's when people live in harmony together. So uh, in the time of the Supreme Buddha, there were other spiritual teachers, of course. But when they passed away, sometimes everything fell apart right? because their Dhamma wasn't very well proclaimed. And so when the, the teacher passed away, then the students because they, they didn't have a good Dhamma to practice, they started fighting with each other. They say, you know, I'm the one who understands this now. And someone else would say, no, 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 you don't understand it, I understand it. And they would, they would quarrel, even so much that the lay disciples would get discouraged and say, ugh, what good is this Dhamma, right? So that was an ordinary thing that would happen. But this Brahmin saw that that didn't happen to these, to these monks and nuns, these lay disciples. When the Supreme Buddha passed away, they continued to live in harmony. So what, how does that happen? How can that be? That's not an ordinary thing. Then the Venerable Ananda says, We are not without a refuge, Brahman. We have a refuge. So what do you think the refuge is? The Dhamma, yes. We have a refuge. We have the Dhamma as our refuge. So now the, the Brahman he needs, to, he needs to really understand this. So he says, when we asked, uh, is there anyone that the Supreme Buddha has appointed to be the, the leader after he was gone? You said no. And when we asked, has the Sangha elected someone? You said no. And then we asked, well, why are you harmonious? Who do you take refuge in? Uh, and, they said, and you said, we take the Dhamma 
as our refuge. What does that mean? How can I understand that? How does someone, how does someone have a teaching as their leader? Right? Ordinarily, people think of a leader as someone that they can go to, someone that they can, they can ask questions to. But here, the Venerable Ananda is saying, no, uh, the Dhamma is what we go for refuge to. So then the Venerable Ananda explains. He says, Brahman, the blessed one who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, has prescribed the course of training for bhikkhus and has laid down the patimokkha. So do you know what the patimokkha is? Yeah. So the Supreme Buddha, when he was alive, when there was a problem in the Sangha, when someone did something that, that wasn't appropriate, he would make a rule. So he waited until there was some problem, until something happened, and then he could say, okay, see this problem? You shouldn't do that. We're going to have a way to, to prevent that, that problem from happening. So he would lay down a rule. And sometimes he would adjust the rules uh, if conditions changed or, or add details to the rules. So this is what a, a Supreme Buddha does sometimes. And when a Supreme Buddha lays down a patimokkha in great detail, then his dispensation will last for a very long time. So some Supreme Buddhas, they, they, don't, they don't give a patimokkha like this in great detail. They give a very basic patimokkha. Uh, abstain from doing wrong, do wholesome things, purify your mind. And for the monks that are alive in that time, they're able to use that because they're very wise. They're able to use that uh, as their, as their training, as their patimokkha. But when a Supreme Buddha lays down a patimokkha in great detail, then those rules get passed on from generation to generation, and the dispensation can last a long time. So we can see already uh, that our Gautama Supreme Buddha's dispensation has lasted over 2,500 years because he laid down this, this patimokkha in detail. So the Venerable Ananda continues. He says, On the Oposita days, as many of us live in dependence on a single village district, meet together in unison. So all of those monks who live in dependence on a, on a certain city, they would get together in harmony. And when we meet, we ask one who knows the Patimokkha to recite it. So this is what monks do even now. They get together, all the monks that, that live together, they get together, and one monk recites all of these rules as a reminder uh, every two weeks on the full moon and on the new moon. So if a bhikkhu remembers an offense or a transgression while the patimokkha is being recited, we make him act in accordance with the Dhamma, in accordance with the instructions. So the Supreme Buddha, uh, all the rules are not uh, equal in terms of how you correct your behavior. So some of the rules uh, are very serious rules, like engaging in sexual uh, activity with another person, uh, stealing something of value, very heavy things like that, uh, lying about your uh, spiritual attainments, killing a human being. So uh, if someone breaks those rules, then what happens to them? They're no longer a monk. They can't continue uh, to live with the Sangha. Even if they're wearing robes still, they're not a monk. When someone has broken one of those rules, uh, there's, no, there's no way that the Supreme Buddha gave for, for uh, correcting uh, that misconduct. So as long as that person lives, they're not able to, to become uh, a monk again. So then there are other rules, uh, Sangha Disesa rules. So those rules are very serious. If someone breaks one of those rules, then you have to get a large group of monks together to help that, that monk overcome that offense. So he has to go through a period of uh, probation where he has to follow special rules. It's very complicated. And in order to, uh, to clear that offense, you have to get together 20 monks uh, to, to clear that offense. So this, these are very serious rules. Then... Uh, some rules uh, involve accepting something that they're not that you're not allowed to have, or having something that you're not allowed to have. 
then with those rules, you have to give up whatever this is uh, that you've accepted uh, or something that you've, you've mishandled. So for example, if a monk uh, accepts money from someone, monks are not allowed to, to accept money. So that's one of these special rules. The monk has to, has to give up that money to the sangha, uh, and then the sangha has to dispose of it. If a monk, uh, so for example, our three robes, our upper robe, our lower robe, and our outer robe, we have to be with those robes each day. We can't get separated from those robes. So uh, if dawn comes and goes and we're separated from those robes, then we have to confess that to another monk. Not only that, we have to, to forfeit that robe to the monk. We have to, to give it to the other monk, and then the monk gives it back to us, and then we can start to use it again. Uh, robe cloth, we can only keep for a, a short period of time without determining uh, what we're going to use it for, without making it into a, a requisite. So this keeps monks from, from collecting too much, too much stuff, too much cloth. So if we get uh, some cloth, we have a certain amount of time to make that into a requisite. And if we take too long, if we try and hoard the cloth, we forget about it, then before we can use that cloth, we have to, to give it up to another monk. And then the monk gives, us, gives it back to us, and we have uh, another period of time to, to take care of that. Right? So amazing things, you know, details that, that we would have never thought about but ways that the Supreme Buddha gave us to train our mind, to make sure we were very careful about the requisites that we, that we used, about the way we interacted with other people, with the Sangha. So uh, some rules we have to give something up before we can confess it. Some rules we just have to confess it to another, to another monk. And once we've confessed it, then we're, then we're cleared of that offense. So that's what it's talking about here. That is, the monks listen to the Patimokkha. If they hear a rule and they think, oh, I've broken that rule, then right then and there, they have to turn to another monk and say, Venerable Sir, I broke this rule. And then they have to do whatever it is to clear up that rule. Uh, either arrange for the Sangha to, to meet together uh, as a large group to, to clear the offense, or uh, they have to give something up, or they, they simply have to confess it to another monk. So the Venerable Ananda continues, he says, If a bhikkhu remembers an offense or a transgression while the Patimokkha is being recited, we make him act in accordance with the Dhamma, in accordance with the instructions. It is not the worthy ones that make us act. It's the Dhamma that makes us act. So we have these instructions from the Supreme Buddha that tell us how we, how we overcome these offenses, how we deal with, with these problems. And not only the Patimokkha, but the Supreme Buddha taught us in many ways how we live harmoniously, how we can overcome disputes. Uh, he gave very detailed instructions when people argue, how do, you, how do you help those people come back together? How do you help them overcome that, that disagreement? Because if people have these disagreements about the Dhamma, about the Vinaya, then the Sangha can't live in harmony. And when the Sangha isn't living in harmony, it's very hard to practice meditation. Right? It's hard to sit in your kuti if people outside are, are yelling and screaming at each other. Right? Or maybe you're, maybe you're one of those people that's, that's angry at someone. Right? When, you sit, uh, when you sit down to meditate, what do you think about? That person that, that's, that you think has done something to you. Right? Or you're angry that they're, you think they're teaching the Dhamma in a, in a bad way. Right? It's very hard to, to practice this Dhamma, if we're fighting with other people, if we're arguing. So then, the Brahman asks him, Is there, Master Ananda, any single bhikkhu who you now honor, respect, revere, and venerate, and on whom you live in dependence, honoring and respecting him? So, he says, Is there a bhikkhu that you respect, that, that you live uh, following, his, uh, following his help. And the Venerable Ananda says, yes. Yes, there is a single bhikkhu Brahman who we now honor, respect, revere, and venerate, and on whom we live in dependence, honoring and respecting him. 
So now the Brahmin is, uh, he's confused again. So he goes back through all of his questions. He says, but, but the Supreme Buddha didn't pick someone, and the Sangha didn't pick someone. So who is this person? Who is this person? Why didn't the Supreme Buddha pick them? You know, what, how does this happen? How is this going on? Because you said, there is, there is a monk that we respect, that we honor, that we venerate. So he asks, Venerable Ananda, how should we, how should we understand this? So this is what the, the Venerable Ananda says. There are, Brahman, ten qualities inspiring confidence that have been declared by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. When these qualities are found in anyone among us, we honor, respect, revere, and venerate him, and live in dependence on him, honoring and respecting him. So this is the amazing nature of the Supreme Buddha's Dhamma, of the Supreme Buddha's dispensation, that he said, these are the qualities that I want you to look for in someone. And this type of person, they're the type of person that you should respect. Their advice, you should follow their advice. They'll help you understand this Dhamma. So this, this system, it's really excellent, isn't it? Because even if the Supreme Buddha had, had appointed someone, right? maybe some people like that person, some people don't, they, they get in disputes over that, and then that person passes away. Right? And then a new person has to be elected or chosen. But what the Supreme Buddha did, he said, these are the qualities that you should look for. And it's really excellent because these are also qualities that we should develop in ourselves. Right? So when we, when we know that these qualities are to be respected in another person, then we know for sure these are qualities that we should try and develop in ourselves. So the first quality... Here, Brahman, a bhikkhu is virtuous. He dwells restrained with the restraint of the patimokkha. He is perfect in conduct and resort, and seeing fear in the slightest faults. He trains himself by undertaking the training precepts. So this first quality of this, this monk that should be followed, he trains in the patimokkha. So he knows the rules, he practices them well, and his virtue is perfect. He's afraid of doing something even very small, that might be blamable. So he has he has excellent virtue. This is the first thing to look out for. So these qualities, these are very important for us. We don't we shouldn't think that these are just qualities that were important to the Venerable Ananda, right? Long, long ago. That these are what we need to look out for in people, in any Kalyanamitta, to see, you know, is this someone who's virtuous? Can I trust their actions? Are they going to do the right thing, even when it's difficult? Because the Supreme Buddha says, if we want to understand this Dhamma, we have to associate with good people. Because when we do that, we get to hear the Blessed One's teachings. So we need to know how to identify who these good people are that we want to associate with. So the second quality, he has learned much, remembers what he has learned, and consolidates what he has learned. So he knows the Dhamma. Uh, and not only that, but he's practiced this Dhamma well. He doesn't just memorize the teachings, but he looks at them, he reflects on them, he thinks about them. You know, what, what is the meaning of this? How can I apply this to my life? So he hasn't just memorized that, that the eye is impermanent, that visual objects are impermanent. Right? He's been able to see for himself directly that, that anything that he's able to see with his eyes is completely impermanent, it won't last, that there's nothing that, that we'll get any happiness from by being attached to. So he understands this very deeply, not just, uh, not just memorized these things, but has, has investigated them and knows absolutely for sure that this Dhamma is true. So this is the second quality. He's learned a lot of Dhamma and investigated it and understood it very well. The third quality He's content with his robes, alms food, resting place, and medicinal requisites. So whatever robes he gets, he's happy to wear those. Whatever food he gets, that's good enough for him. Whatever uh, bed he's given to sleep on, he's happy with that 
with that bed. Whatever medicine uh, he's given for his illness, he makes do with that medicine. The Supreme Buddha said that someone who's not happy with their alms food, who criticizes the alms food, will never be able to concentrate their mind. Right? If you're not if you're not happy with these things that you get, then your mind is always thinking, oh, how can I get better alms food? Maybe if I go for alms round in this village, uh, on this street, if they're wealthy, I'll get better food there. Right? So instead of sitting in his kuti, cultivating wholesome thoughts, he's scheming, he's planning. How can I get better alms food? You know, Who might want to give me a nice robe? So this is how... Uh, this is how some bhikkhus spend their time, but we want to we want to look and see how can we find a monk who's content with with whatever's given to him. So the fourth quality, he obtains at will without any trouble or difficulty the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding here and now. So because of these other wholesome qualities he's cultivated, he's able to concentrate his mind. He can, he can attain these, these four jhanas, these very deep states of meditation, having overcome the hindrances. So the fifth quality, he has the various kinds of supernormal powers. So having been one, he becomes many. Having been many, he becomes one. So uh, a monk that has these psychic powers, they can duplicate their body. They can appear in more than one place at a time. They can pass through walls, uh, pass through a mountain, just like it was uh, space. They can walk through the air, just like it was like they were walking on the earth. They can dive into the earth, just like it was water. They can walk on the water, just like it was the earth. They're able to, to fly through the air, just sitting cross-legged. So we know many of the Supreme Buddha's disciples had these psychic powers, don't we? That these, that these were qualities that we can see in the Supreme Buddha's disciples. So the sixth quality, he's developed uh, the divine ear. So this is a special, uh, a special quality where beings are able to hear sounds that are very far away. Normally, we can just hear those, those sounds that are in the same room or maybe close by outside. But someone who's developed the divine ear, they can hear sounds that are very far away. And not only ordinary sounds like we can hear, but heavenly sounds. They can, they can hear uh, the sounds of heavenly beings. So the seventh quality, he understands the minds of other beings. So this is a special quality that, uh, that some beings are able to develop, where they can understand the nature of other human beings' minds. Do you remember the instructions we got a few days ago? The, the Supreme Buddha said, if we, can't, uh, if we can't read the minds of others, whose mind should we be able to read? Our own mind, right. So that's a very important, uh, a very important practice for us. But there were, in fact, uh, monks who were able to know the minds, of other, uh, the minds of other beings. So they would know a mind that was affected by lust, as a lustful mind, a mind affected by hate, as a mind affected by hate, a mind affected by delusion, as a mind affected by delusion, a contracted and a distracted mind. So they could tell what's going on in this person's mind. Are they happy right now? Or are they, are they depressed? Do they have uh, greed in their mind, hate in their mind, delusion in their mind? So we can, we can understand that that if we can find a monk like this, it's very helpful, isn't it? Right? We can go to that, that person, and they understand the nature of our mind. They can, they can know right away how to help us. So all these different qualities of the mind, someone can know. Then the eighth quality, he can remember his past lives. Not just one life, not just two lives, but many, many lives, thousands of lives, hundreds of thousands of lives and not just uh, what his name was in the previous life, but all the details about how he lived that life. Uh, so this is the eighth quality, the ability to recollect uh, his own past lives. And the ninth quality, the ability to understand 
how beings pass on according to their actions. So we can see very clearly how important this quality would be in someone who is trying to help us, that they would be able to teach us, you know, when you do these sorts of actions, it's going to have this result. They've seen for themselves how beings pass on to a bad destination because they've done unwholesome things and how beings who've practiced meditation, who've practiced generosity, who've practiced morality, that they are reborn in a heavenly destination, in a good place. And then the tenth quality, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, he here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. So is this an ordinary human being? They've destroyed all the taints. What does that make them? It makes them an arahant, right? So these arahants, these are beings that, that we want to listen to. We want to follow their instructions. We want to have them as kalyanamittas. So then the, the Venerable Ananda says, these Brahman are the 10 qualities inspiring confidence that have been declared by the Blessed One. So these, these are the things that we look for in a person. And when someone has these 10 qualities, then they're someone that we go to uh, for protection. We ask for their help. We want to follow their instructions. Because maybe uh, some of these people, they, they attained these qualities after the Supreme Buddha passed away. So if the Supreme Buddha had said, okay, you know, this group of people, this person, they have these qualities, follow this person, then, then we would think that we're following a person. But when we know that there are qualities that we have to look for, then we, we can see for ourselves, yes, this is, the, this is the person that we need to follow. We know why we're following them, because they have virtue, because they have knowledge, because they have these abilities, that, that they're someone that we should follow. So then the Brahman Vasakara uh, said to the general Upananda, who was with him, he says, what do you think, general? When these worthy ones honor one who should be honored, respected, one who should be respected, revered, uh, revere one who should be revered, and venerate one who should be venerated, surely they honor someone who should be honored. They respect someone who should be respected. They venerate someone who should be respected, who should be venerated. Because if they couldn't honor these people, if they couldn't venerate these people, then who on earth could they honor? Right? If these people weren't worthy of respect, who could possibly be worthy of respect in this world? So he says, I'm sure that these monks, they're respecting the right, the right kind of person. So then the Brahman Vasakara asked the Venerable Ananda, where are you living now? And the Venerable Ananda said, uh, that I'm living in the bamboo grove. And the, the Brahman Vasakara asked him, I hope that you're living there peacefully. I hope that it's a good place for you to practice meditation. That, that you're not disturbed by, by voices. That it's a peaceful place, a good place for retreat. And the Venerable Ananda says, Indeed, sir, it is a good place for us to live. It is a peaceful place because of, of guardian protectors like you. So because of lay people like you who protect these places, who provide these places, we're able to live there peacefully. And then the Brahmin says, so indeed, the bamboo grove is pleasant. It's a good place for retreat because of monks like you, worthy ones like you, who are meditators and cultivate meditation. Because of, of monks like you, the bamboo grove is a peaceful place. It's a good place for meditation. So here we, we learn about this relationship that, that the monks and nuns have with, with lay people. That the lay people provide the requisites, and then the monks and nuns, they teach the Dhamma. They practice the Dhamma very well, and then they teach this Dhamma to the lay people. So then the Brahman says, uh, yes, it's excellent because you're practicing meditation there. Once I went to listen to the Supreme Buddha preach, 
and he preached in many ways about meditation. Then he says the Supreme Buddha was a master meditator, and he praised every kind of meditation. So what do you think? Did the Supreme Buddha praise every kind of meditation? He praised a lot of kinds of meditation. So then the Venerable Ananda says, the Blessed One Brahman did not praise every kind of meditation, nor did he condemn every kind of meditation. So here's one of those subtle, subtle points where people, uh, he thought he understood the Dhamma, right? He heard the Supreme Buddha talk in praise of all sorts of kinds of meditation, so he made this guess. He said, the Supreme Buddha must praise all kinds of meditation. But the Venerable Ananda said, no, he didn't praise all kinds of meditation. He didn't condemn every kind of meditation, but he didn't praise every kind of meditation. He said, suppose someone has lust in their mind, someone has a greedy mind, and they sit there thinking these thoughts of lust, thinking these thoughts of greed. So, and the person doesn't even know how to overcome these thoughts of lust, these thoughts of greed. Van Ananda said, the Supreme Buddha didn't praise this kind of meditation. So when we sit and we, we have all sorts of greedy thoughts, we think that we're meditating, we're meditating on our greedy thoughts, the Supreme Buddha said, no, that's not a good meditation. When we have hateful thoughts in our mind, when we keep thinking these hateful thoughts over and over again, the Supreme Buddha said, that's not my meditation. That's not the kind of meditation that you should be doing. So when we have these five hindrances, when we have sleepiness and drowsiness, when we're restless, when we're worried, when we have doubt, we can sit on the cushion and meditate for an hour, but we're not following the Supreme Buddha's teachings. Then the, the Venerable Ananda says, but there is a kind of meditation that he praised. So what was that? The four jhanas. When someone is able to overcome these five hindrances, concentrate their mind, and attain these jhanas, the Supreme Buddha said, this is the right kind of meditation. This is the kind of meditation that I praise. And so the, the Brahmin says, so Master Ananda is correct. So the Supreme Buddha praised the right kind of meditation, and he condemned the wrong kind of meditation. So the Supreme Buddha did make a distinction that there's good meditation and bad meditation. So then uh, the Brahman Vasakara said, thank you very much, but we're very busy. We have lots of things to do. So unfortunately, he didn't say, oh, this is excellent. Let's do some meditation. Let's sit down and, and practice this meditation. Why couldn't he do that? He was a householder, right? He had work to do. He had lots of things to, to take care of. So uh, he paid respect and he left uh, the Venerable Ananda. So soon after he left, uh, the Brahmin Gopaka Moggallana said to the Venerable Ananda, Master Ananda has not yet answered what we asked him. But the Venerable Ananda says, no, we did. We answered all your questions, right? So this Brahman, he wasn't paying attention very well, right? It's kind of sad. He has this chance to listen to the Dhamma, but clearly he wasn't, he wasn't paying very close attention. So what did, what did we learn about? We learned about uh, whether or not the Supreme Buddha picked a, a successor. We learned whether or not uh, there was any monk who possessed all the qualities of the Supreme Buddha, whether the Sangha picked a monk to be in charge. We learned about uh, what it is that the Supreme Buddha, that the Sangha follows, that lets them live in harmony, that they follow the Supreme Buddha's Dhamma. And we learned these qualities that we look for in a person, who we want to respect, who we want to venerate, who we want to, to listen to. And we learned about the different kinds of meditation that the Supreme Buddha praised and those kinds of meditation that he didn't praise. So the Venerable Ananda says, did we not tell you, Brahman, there is no single bhikkhu, Brahman, who possesses in each and every way all those qualities that were possessed by the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. 
for the Blessed One was the arouser of the unarisen path, the producer of the unproduced path, the declarer of the undeclared path. He was the knower of the path, the finder of the path, the one skilled in the path, but his disciples now abide following that path and become possessed of it afterwards. Sadhu, 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 namo buddhaya.